Thank you, thank you, grazie, sia lodato Gesù Cristo. E buona Pasqua a tutti, eh? And that's, ci basta per l'italiano, ok? Uh, thank you, thanks everybody for your very gracious invitation and warm welcome. Uh, and might I start with a little prayer, and is it ever good to say this? St. John the 23rd and St. John Paul II, pray for us. Prega per noi, pregate per noi. Father Walk, thank you for your gracious invitation. You are right. We, uh, we share a birthday, February 6th, right? It's not only Ronald Reagan's birthday. You know this. It is Dolly Parton's birthday. And it is Zsa Zsa Gabor's birthday. So, <laughs> now, I, I realize this is being translated, all right? And I, I, hope, I hope that they can uh, get the translations right. That's always very delicate, isn't it, in translating? When I was rector of the North American College, remember how St. John Paul II, always on Holy Thursday, put out a beautiful letter to priests. And one day, one year it was kind of late, I think it came out, the Monday or the Tuesday of Holy Week, oh, first in Italian. There were not the other languages available. And so I asked one of the uh, secretaries at the North American College, whose English was pretty good, but not perfect, if she would quickly translate it into English so I could give it to the students for their Holy Week meditation. It wasn't very long. And as you might recall, the first words of whatever John Paul would write, uh, priest, he would say, carissimi fratelli. And the secretary started off with the translation, most expensive brothers. <laughs> <laughs> which, which was accurate, said so now, now as a bishop, I know that is very accurate, all right. So, Many, many of you very kind people in front of me this beautiful spring afternoon happen to be experts in communications. The man in front of you is not. This man has a lot to learn about communications. This man has learned a lot in the best school of all, learning from one's mistake. Monsignor Romera and Professor Arasa Thank you for your invitation and warm welcome. I'm very happy as well to see so many friends here and so many people whose talents I so appreciate and admire when it comes to communications. I'm happy to see the secretary for the Pontifical Council of Social Communications, a pontifical council in which I'm privileged to serve, Monsignor Paul Tai. My words today to you come from the heart. They are based on what we Americans call the school of hard knocks. I don't have a diploma in communications. I have learned a lot from my interactions with the media, especially since I became Archbishop of New York five years ago. So I hope my observations to you, inaugurating this very promising symposium, you will find helpful. They will be basic, they will be practical, they will hardly be novel, technical, or Monsignor Romera, I'm sorry, philosophical, all right? <laughs> Shortly after my appointment as Archbishop of New York, a reporter from one of our local television stations came for an interview. It was the first time I had met this particular reporter. And after a few courtesies and pleasantries, he changed the line of questioning into what I think he expected to be a gotcha moment. I'd like to see that translated, by the way, a gotcha <laughs> moment. That's, that's one of those Americanisms, all right? What he wanted to make me feel uncomfortable. So he said to me, the Catholic Church has a history of being unfriendly and unwelcoming to gays and lesbians. What would you say, new Archbishop, 
to a gay Catholic if he or she were sitting before you right now? He leaned back, watch me carefully to see if this new archbishop would get flustered. What to say? So I replied, the first thing I would tell him or her is that Jesus loves him, that I love him, that the church loves him, that I'm sorry if I or anybody else in the church has not always been particularly good at expressing that love. And I would let him know how welcome he or she was in the church, in the family of the church, to join the rest of us sinners in our journey of conversion of heart and complete reliance on God's grace and mercy. I'm not sure what this correspondent expected me to say, but it was clear that my answer caught him very much off guard. He hesitated for just a moment, and now rather surprised and intrigued, we then began to have a very thoughtful conversation on church teaching, how the church hasn't always lived up to what it professes, and how that teaching can become either accidentally or deliberately misunderstood. He was surprised that I had not validated his prejudices about the church by condemning gay people instead of expressing love and respect for them. Now, I don't remember how much of that exchange made it onto the air that evening, and certainly lots of other topics got discussed during the half hour or so that the interview lasted. I do recall that even when the cameras went off and the microphones were put away, our conversation continued. As he sought to better understand what it was I was trying to express about the church and its teaching, I hope that was a good occasion of evangelization. And I'm happy to report that this journalist has asked me back often for other interviews. That setting provided me with a good introduction to the New York media, and I've had many similar encounters since. Their initial posture often might be bellicose, but that should only challenge us, never scare us, or make us uncomfortable with them. That experience reinforced for me some basic truths that people like you and me, who are involved in the business of communication, and I think every bishop today has to see himself in that enterprise, must bear in mind as we set out to bring the invitation of Jesus and his church to a world that doesn't always seem interested in what we have to say, misunderstands it, or is downright hostile toward it. So let me make seven, seven observations. It's a good number for us Catholics, isn't it? Seven. For one, we need a real sense of professionalism, professionalism in all that we do. We adhere to the best and highest standards. And I don't, I don't just mean that we have to use the best technology. Yes, of course, using the most up-to-date technology and taking advantage of all the resources of the new media is indeed critically important. But the way we use that technology the way we conduct ourselves must meet the highest professional and ethical standards. How we say something is just as important as what we say. This is one of the reasons I am very grateful to the faculty and staff here at Santa Croce for helping to elevate communications to a sacred science worthy of the very best that we can offer. It, when you think about it, communications in the church continues the incarnation, the word made flesh dwelling among us. Through communications, we, like our blessed mother Mary, provide the word of God once again with a human nature. 
Sometimes I'm afraid I have to admit that others, like the evangelicals, our Jewish neighbors, and Mormons, I'm speaking about the United States, are much more intentional, professional, and up-to-date in communications than we Catholics are. Thanks be to God for programs like this one here at Santa Croce, which is trying to change that. Number two, if we are going to be effective in our ministry of communications, <laughs> We are never afraid to tell the truth, even when we're dealing with bad news. What we hear over and over again is that people want and expect utter honesty and transparency from the church. If a priest has an alcohol addiction and must be removed from his parish for treatment, if a lay employee is found to be stealing from the diocese and has to be turned over to the police. If a permanent deacon has an allegation of sexual harassment brought against him. And sadly, we've had to deal with each of these situations in our own archdiocese. Our people want to hear about it first from us, not from the media. We're almost never criticized for somebody's misbehavior. After all, everybody has had experiences in their own families or with friends and co-workers of addiction, wrongdoing, or inappropriate behavior. What we are criticized for, and rightly so, is if we attempt to cover it up or if we say nothing, letting our people hear it rather from the media. To be proactive in the truth is a good strategy. Yesterday, that great pope, St. John Paul II, was raised to the altars. And we gratefully recall his constant refrain, be not afraid. That courage, that trust can surely inspire us as we communicate. As Jesus promised, the truth shall set you free. Pope Leo XIII remarked, and we church historians are very fond of repeating it, La chiesa non ha paura della verità. The church is never afraid of the truth. In the same way, we should never be able to tell the truth even when we're dealing with good news. Just a few weeks ago, for instance, I spent a beautiful Saturday morning with more than 3,000 men who had gathered on the campus of a Catholic college for a day of fellowship and strengthening their Catholic faith. Was it ever an inspiring day? I was really feeling good about the life of the church. But then as I was leaving, a reporter from a local newspaper approached with no interest at all in discussing the remarkably good news of thousands of men freely choosing to spend a magnificent Saturday in the spring deepening their faith. Rather, the reporter wanted to rehash some old, exaggerated accusations about the imprudent use of money by the bishop of the diocese where that college was located. I answered her question as best I could, but I continued to remind her of the real news here. 3,000 Catholic men excited about their faith. That's my job in your job as well. I often tease journalists that they more often than not ask me about the olds, the weary, exhausted stories about the church rather than about the news. Just last week, for instance, in a national interview for Easter, I kept bringing up the remarkable fact that at the Easter vigil the night before, 2,000 adults entered the faith in the parishes throughout the Archdiocese of New York. Now that is news. In this day and age, 2,000 people freely decide to become Catholic. The interviewer was more interested in sex abuse. That's olds. That's not news. By the way, on another, after one of, the, one of Pope Francis's uh, statements, I was called into an interview where 
the interviewer said to me, do you think this church is obsessed with sex? And I said, no, I think you are, all right? <laughs> They're the ones that always ask about it. They're the ones that always bring it up. We don't, all right? Three, every communications outlet has a bias, a slant. That's natural. That's to be expected. Some newspapers promote conservative values. Others take a liberal position. In the United States, we have one particular news channel that is known to favor the Democrats, while its competition usually features Republicans. We Catholic communicators also should have our own bias. And that slant must always be pro-church. We do not apologize for that. There are those, even among Catholic outlets, who will always seek to criticize the magisterium, or the bishops, or the bishops, or the bishops, no matter the issue. <laughs> the bishops are to blame for everything from global warming to male pattern baldness. <laughs> I find that this anti-church bias exists among some on both the so-called left wing and right wing of the church. Once you open some Catholic newspapers or journals, <laughs> the attacks on the bishops immediately jump out at you. Now, this would not be surprising, sad, but not surprising, if it came from a secular journal. But from a Catholic one, the common characteristic of identifiably left and right publications, at least in the English-speaking world, is that they both relentlessly criticize bishops. The bias is anti-bishop. Now, I don't mean to suggest that those of us who have the responsibility of church leadership should be immune to criticism are that reporters and others should refrain from asking hard questions about decisions that are made? No, not at all. That attitude, which is nothing less than a thinly veiled clericalism, has gotten the church into a lot of hot water. Too many times for us to even think about going back to it. We bishops deserve criticism. We need it. We welcome it. We take it to heart as long as it's fair, even, and civil. What I do mean to suggest is that we can't have a knee-jerk reaction, that everything a bishop does is wrong, that there are good bishops and bad bishops, that every teaching of the church is up for grabs, that there is nothing positive happening in the Catholic world. It's up to us to find the positive stories, the good news, and give them at least an equal amount of space and time as the negative stories receive. We need to share the joy and the beauty of being a Catholic. Like it or not, most Catholics get their news about the church not from Catholic media, but from the secular media. And it can often be slanted, biased, or inaccurate. So, they look to the Catholic media for the real story. And they look to the Catholic communications not just for information, but for formation in the faith, what it really means. Number four, at the same time, you and I have to admit that just as we don't like it when the media caricatures <coughs> us, whether it be bishops or Catholics, we should not stereotype them. Sure, there are a, a small handful of reporters or new media types who would like nothing more than to tear down the church, who twist and distort always what we say and what we do. We must be careful in these situations to make certain that we always respond in charity and love. 
even to those who are bent on attacking the church relentlessly. We follow the instruction of Jesus by not responding to invective with harsh words of our own. Yeah, at times we must respond to mean, vicious, and inaccurate attacks, and even defend the church from nasty accusations, but we do it cleanly and civilly. Almost weekly, for instance, I'm <laughs> tempted to attack our local New York newspaper for yet another groundless punch at the church's stomach, or my stomach, which is a very easy target, all right? <clears throat> Attacks usually by columnists who tell us constantly that they were raised Catholic. Such counterattacks are usually not productive. Fortunately, those, who, those seeking to harm the church are by far the exceptions among secular journalists. I find they're not the norm. The vast majority of reporters are only looking for access, availability, and information. If we don't give it, they'll look elsewhere, and they'll often turn to those who do want to criticize and attack the church. So we can't afford to hide from them or run from them, and we should never want to. I recently came across a writing by Rabbi Norman Lamb explaining the Hebrew word anivat, A-N-I-V-U-T. The rabbi explains that this word means a soft answer to a harsh challenge, silence in the face of abuse, graciousness when receiving honor, dignity in response to humiliation, forbearance and quiet calm when confronted with calumny and carping criticism. Sounds like we Catholic communicators should strive to earn the description anivat. Jesus, our model, sure did. Is not this openness and accessibility of which I speak part of what makes Pope Francis such a gifted communicator? From the very first moment that the world met Jorge Bergoglio, as he appeared on the balcony and said very simply, Buonasera, he told the whole world what a gentle, humble, loving Pope we had. Everything that he has said, and just as importantly, everything that he has done since that day, has communicated a beautiful message of love, of God's goodness and mercy, of the need for the church to be of the people, of the poor, of the weak, the threatened, and the powerless. Pope Francis knows what he wants to say, and he knows how to say it. He combines a rare ability to teach the faith while simultaneously displaying its grace, its beauty, its joy. It's not a part of some grand public relations agenda designed to improve the image of the church. It's just who Pope Francis is. Nobody, no communications expert, had to sit down with him and say, now, Holy Father, listen, we, th we think it would really be a good idea if, if you concentrated on talking about God's mercy and forgiveness. People will really respond to this. Here's a great idea, Holy Father. Get somebody to take a picture of you kneeling at the confessional, going to confession. That'll make your poll numbers go through the roof. There's, there's no way somebody could script who he is. What you see is what you get. And the world is responding. Because his whole life is dedicated to conveying the good news simply and sincerely in everything that he does. Number five. I propose to you present and future communicators, that we bear in mind the need always to be catechetical, catechetical in our approach. As Father Jim Martin, the talented Jesuit writer, says, dogma matters. He's right. We cannot underestimate people's lack of knowledge about our Catholic faith, both within our own flock 
and even and especially those outside the church. What we might consider to be the simplest and most elemental points, the incarnation, the trinity, the resurrection, words like liturgy, Eucharist, or even the word catechetics, are almost always misunderstood, not just by the mainstream media, but often by average Catholics as well. Anything that we can do clearly, confidently, simply, succinctly, joyfully to explain our faith is worth our time and effort. The simpler, the better. We recently at St. Joseph's Seminary in the Archdiocese of New York had a special guest address our students, Dr. Henry Kissinger. You've heard of Dr. Kissinger. And they asked him about his relationship with presidents. He, of course, worked very much with President Richard Nixon, but he also worked with President Ronald Reagan. <coughs> he said Richard Nixon had an amazingly profound understanding of the Cold War. And when, when Dr. Kissinger asked President Nixon, explain to me your philosophy about the Cold War, President Nixon would go on for an hour, as profound as could be, in explaining his philosophy about the Cold War. The first time he met Ronald Reagan, he said, Mr. President, what is your philosophy on the Cold War? And Reagan said, we win, they lose. <laughs> now, <laughs> the simpler, the better. The media is often where people, for better or worse, I'm afraid, receive their catechesis today. Monsignor John Tracy Ellis, perhaps the preeminent historian of the Catholic Church in the United States, used to comment that our major challenge in the church is that our Catholic people go to Walter Cronkite for church teaching. Walter Cronkite was a very famous newscaster in America. Uh, whether we like it or not, our people find out what the church teaches from the secular media. That's why we, Catholic communicators, need to look for teachable moments. When there is interest in the church that we as good teachers use for our own advantage. Ash Wednesday, Easter Sunday, Christmas, canonizations like yesterday are all obvious times when media interest can be high. And we can use the media then to introduce and explain our teaching. There are many such occasions in the church, like a conclave, which reminds me of what I'm afraid was a missed opportunity after Pope Benedict officially resigned the papacy 15 months ago. The Cardinals of America, you might recall, used the days in Rome before the start of last year's conclave to hold a series of daily informal press briefings. Many of you asked us to do it because you were, you were hungry for news. You had to get stories home. It was our goal to help the press, who were under a, a lot of pressure to file new and interesting stories day after day after day to focus on positive aspects of the church. And the press responded. Without compromising the understandable and necessary confidentiality of the congregations, those private daily meetings of the College of Cardinals before the conclave, we were able in those press conferences to talk about such things as mood, states of mind, and the process itself. And I'm told from many of you that it was a rather successful venture. But we were then disappointed when we came under criticism for that. And we're eventually asked to discontinue these briefings during the congregation meetings. I believe it was an opportunity lost. Because guess what? Then the only sources of information became the gossip <coughs> and the leaks orchestrated by journalists who happen to live here. Now, listen up. 
I don't mean to suggest that only cardinals can represent the church in these and other circumstances. <laughs> On the contrary, the day of old, fat, balding bishops all right. <laughs> Being the best spokespeople for the church is long gone, if they were ever really here at all. Every diocese and church organization now needs to have trained, competent lay people to represent them. One of the best moves that we bishops in the United States of America made is when we hired a woman by the name of Helen Alvare to be our spokesperson on pro-life issues. Here we had an articulate, credible, nice looking, <laughs> wife and mother who was able to speak for bishops in the Catholic community on the all important pro-life cause. She was so effective that the pro-abortionist would not debate her on news programs. Think, for instance, of the wonderful work done by Catholic Voices in the United Kingdom in the weeks and months leading up to Pope Benedict's 2010 visit. A group of young, vibrant, cheerful, educated women and men completely changed the media narrative and the anticipated hostile reception was transformed into a rousing welcome. I'm glad that you're scheduled to hear from Austin Everay, the founder of Catholic Voices, and I hope that every diocese will follow his lead in finding and supporting such spokespeople. We are certain, uh, did I say it right, Austin? All right, okay. <laughs> All right, we do commercials too, you know. We're doing it in the Archdiocese of New York as we've begun working closely with Catholic Voices USA. Just recently, during Holy Week and Easter Week, Thanks to the help of two remarkably respected journalists in the United States, both deeply committed Catholics, Peggy Noonan and Catherine Lopez, we were able to put together two very folksy, effective ads inviting people back to the faith for Easter. And I'm told by independent sources that they were remarkably effective. In the same way, everybody, we also help ourselves when we are up front and include our people in advance when there are important and even controversial decisions or events on the horizon. <clears throat> Since my arrival in New York, for instance, we've had two major controversial strategic planning initiatives. One for our schools, one underway right now for our parishes. Meaning some of them had to close, that's always controversial. In both cases, we publicly announced beforehand what we were planning to do. We invited people to be part of the process. We kept them informed in the press. We listened to their feedback and we accepted their adv advice and input. What could have been a media firestorm, and yes, there's no denying that there were and will be hot moments, has instead, in general, become an occasion of greater understanding of how the diocese operates, the challenges it faces, and how we need the people of God to help us lead. That's not just good communications. I believe it's also good pastoral care for a bishop and the people he shepherds. Six, always always put Jesus first. People have a hunger for meaning in their lives, for the truth. And as St. John Paul II often reminded us, for we as believers, truth has a name, and his name is Jesus. We offer them Jesus before we do anything else. I have made a vow. <coughs> Never will I give an interview without trying to at least mention the holy name of Jesus. Billy Graham said it beautifully, that when we say the name of Jesus publicly, it is unleashed in the airwaves, where it works miracles throughout the universe. It's all about him, not about me. I like to use an analogy from Father Bob Barron, 
another great communicator. Pardon me for this American analogy. But he says, if we Americans try to teach a non-American about baseball, the best way to do that is to take them to a baseball game and let them experience the magic and the mystery. He said, you don't start by trying to explain some minor detail like the infield fly rule. <laughs> now, since you're not all Americans, maybe a more universal example would be that if you wanted to show somebody the beauty of football or soccer, you would start by bringing them to a match, not by detailing a technicality like what a corner kick is all about. It's the same with our faith. We offer people first Jesus, welcoming them into the household of his church, embracing them, and only then do we begin to explain the do's and the don'ts. You think about it. When those first curious and intrigued followers asked Jesus who he was and where he lived, he didn't start with a lecture on the Trinity. He simply said, come and see. I'm afraid, and I have to confess this, I admit this, I have an unconscious pressure every time I'm giving an interview not to get too spiritual, too religious, or too preaching. And that's wrong. It's almost as if I say to myself subconsciously, Dolan, you're not here to evangelize or catechize. Downplay the faith. They want your comments on the real world. Baloney, <laughs> malarkey, all right? I should never pass up an opportunity to evangelize or catechize. As a matter of fact, I am at that interview to evangelize. They asked me for an interview because I'm a pastor, not because I'm the mayor, all right? So I talk about Jesus. And if they don't like it, they won't invite me back. And yippee, because I don't want to go anyway, all right? <coughs> Seven, and last, we have to know our audience. As church media professionals, we need to know who we're talking to. If we're going to be effective and successful, Jesus sure did, using stories and parables that he knew his audience could relate to, and the New Testament inspired authors did the same, adjusting, adjusting their, um, their message to fit the audience, whether Jews or Gentiles, Romans or Philippians. For us, if we want to talk to young adults, that is who we should tailor the message for and be creative in how we try to reach them. An interview I might give to a local Catholic secondary newspaper is going to be different than one I would give to a professional journalist like John Allen. To accomplish this, we must never be afraid to be creative and bold in our communications efforts, or to think that some means of communication might be s somehow inappropriate. I'm a little embarrassed in admitting that I don't know all the particulars of how to update my blog or send out a tweet, just as I don't know how to run the audio board during my weekly radio program. But fortunately, there are a lot of skilled and talented individuals, people like yourselves, who can and do assist me in my work. What I do know is the powerful effect that these new media can have. As everywhere I go, somebody will stop me and say that they liked or didn't like something I said in an interview, a podcast, a blog, a post, or a tweet. I was very impressed by the Archbishop of Toronto, Cardinal Thomas Collins, who I was with yesterday at the beautiful Mass, who told me that he had just, that after the Mass, he was going to Skype the two, uh, the, par the, the uh, parish and the high school named after John Paul II and John the Twenty-Third. It was going to be a live Skype where he was going to speak to the people who were there and allow them to interact. That's a remarkably effective use of an event and a means to get the message across. The church, the church needs the best we can offer everybody. That goes for you and for me. 
and everyone else dedicated to this highly essential ministry in the church. For many years, uh, those who represented us have known a lot about theology, but not much about the art of communications. We need people who know both, who not only know the faith, but can articulate it and send it out in a compelling, colorful, and inviting way. Thanks to your professionalism and hard work, and thanks to the good program here at Santa Croce, and of course, thanks to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we're not going to have to worry about second best in the sacred science of communications. Sio laudato Gesù Cristo. Grazie. Okay.